right, so we are closing out this series, Holy Ghost Stories, uh, today. It's been a six-week series. To be quite honest, I really thought it was only going to be four, but Holy Spirit just kept adding more things and um, just speaking to my mind and my heart uh, through prayer, His His Word, and through others, and I just felt like, hey, we need to extend this a little bit a while longer. And um, so the highlights over the past few weeks, uh, we, we've learned that Holy Ghost is a person, a person, all right, part of the Trinity, a, a, it's great, has got great power, obviously, and has specific purposes. If you can go back and, and listen or watch all of these sermons um, online or on our YouTube channel or Facebook page. Uh, but um, we also learned that there's not just one baptism, but there are three baptism. At the point of salvation, the Holy Spirit baptizes us into Jesus and the church, And uh, after salvation, we choose to be physically baptized in water as a testimony of our faith and our decision to follow Jesus. And then the third baptism is of Jesus baptizing us into the fullness of the Holy Spirit. The fullness, the immersion of Holy Spirit. And then we also learn that Christians can be fully baptized in the Holy Spirit and display the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Holy Ghost, same thing. You and I, if you, have, if you are a born believer, if you have surrendered your life to Jesus, you've accepted him as Lord and Savior, Holy Spirit is inside you, but then you can, you can just be immersed in that. And, um, and you can manifest the power of the Holy Spirit. Our main scripture last week was in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to ask you just to turn to that one just real quick. We've got several passages of scripture we're going to uh, look through today. But the first one we're going to look at is the same one we looked at last week. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And it's chapter 12 verses 7 through 10. And it says this. And this is the Apostle Paul speaking. Note, uh, now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit, there's your key word, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. So that's important. The manifestation of the Spirit is for common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, now we talked about this last week, to another, if you go back to the Greek word, Paul is not talking about to another person. He's talking about, he's categorizing these, uh, these manifestations. To another, the message of knowledge by means of the same spirit. So those two things, wisdom and knowledge, are categorized together. To another, different category, because it's a different Greek word, but in English, we just use the word another. Faith by the same spirit. Uh, To another, gifts of uh, healing by one spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. Those five are all grouped together. And then we have a different Greek word. Our English says to another. But in the Greek, you can go back and look at it. If you have it, look online, you can actually see that. If you have a Greek Bible, you can see this. But has another to another, speaking in different kinds of tongues, and still to another, the interpretation of tongues. So we have this in three different groups. And we have wisdom, knowledge in one, faith, Healing, miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits in another. And then tongues, interpretation of tongues in the final category. The first category, we're going to label that as revelation or hearing from God. You're here from the Lord with wisdom and with knowledge. We talked about that last week. That Our whole message last week was on those first two manifestations of the Holy Spirit. How God speaks to us as we hear from him. Revelation from God. Wisdom and knowledge. And then we have the power of uh, the, the groupings of power of the manifestations, which we're going to talk about today. And then the third and final group is worship, tongues and interpretations of tongues, whether it's private worship between you and the Lord or corporate worship uh, with, with, with believers. And there are certain uh, guidelines that the Bible, and we talked about that two weeks ago, uh, there are certain guidelines that the Bible uses in order to edify the church in a proper way to use that spiritual uh, manifestation of the Holy Spirit. So today, we're going to go to the middle group, the power, and we're going to talk about five of those. So the first one is faith. Everybody say faith. Good. I believe that faith is a foundation of the power 
manifestations of these. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's the foundation of all five of these. And you'll see that as we go on. Faith is, trans, uh, is a translation of a Greek word that means pistis. Okay? Pistis. Greek word is P-I-S-T-I-S in our, in our English lettering. Which means trust, confidence, or assurance. So the Greek word pistis means trust, confidence, and assurance. I would like to use the word trust to mean faith today. So when I... When I say, when we talk about faith, we're actually going to really mean the word trust in today's message. And it's important to distinguish the biblical definition of faith from today's definition that has permeated the Christian church and society. When most people think of faith, they think of it as in terms of a modern definition. Here's what we, we kind of think about faith. Faith, we, we believe that faith is this, firm belief in something for which there is no proof. Firm belief of something which there is no proof. Okay? That's not really trust. Okay? That's our modern definition of faith. And we've kind of, kind of moseyed on into that definition. But that has not trust. When religious people have no proof for what they believe in, we often hear them say, oh, you just have to take it by faith. When they have no proof for what they believe in, oh, just take it by faith. It is vital to understand that belief in something for which there is no proof is far from the biblical definition of faith or really truth. The biblical definition of faith or the biblical definition of truth is trust. And we trust things only after they have been proven to us. So trust is a word we're going to focus on. When you think of faith, Think of trust. Jesus never asked anyone to believe he was Messiah without proof. Jesus never, Jesus never expected people to believe in him without proof. That's why his ministry was inundated with signs and wonders and miracles. It's like, okay, you, you want proof? Here's proof. Here's proof. You can trust, not just, not just faith, you can trust because there is proof. And God does not ask us to believe him without proof. He, he has left much evidence that he exists and that his word is true. Thus, when God asks us to have faith, he's not asking us to believe something without proof. God, provi- God proves himself to us, and because of that, we trust him. That is faith. So I want to make sure you understand this. People who ha- ha- maybe... You're on the verge of of surrendering your life to Jesus. You're trying to figure this out. You're trying to decide, okay, do I make this decision to cross a line of faith? It's it's, it's really trust that you really need to go on. And some people think, well, there's no really proof that God is there, so I guess I just need to have faith. That's wrong. There's lots of proof. There's lots of proof. Walk outside, you know, go, go and look at all of creation. Paul talks about in the book of Romans. There's lots of proof. Not only that, look at his word that has withstand, that has withstood for over uh, 2,000 years. We've got his word as proof. And we've got eyewitnesses. So when you, when you make a decision, yeah, it, it, it's faith, but it's not our, our today's understanding it's faith. It's actually trust when you trust in Jesus. The old hymn, trust and obey, because there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but trust and obey. It's all about trusting. Why can you trust? Because you see the proof. You read the proof. You feel the proof. The prodding at your heart, the knocking on your heart's door, that is is trust. So make sure, we're, when we're talking about faith, we're actually talking about trust. So, we must distinguish between faith that is commonly used in the Bible and the manifestation of faith. So there's faith, or trust, is in the Bible, but then there's the manifestation of that faith. Okay, so remember, faith is the first one we're talking about today. There is Faith, and then there is, tr- there is the manifestations of faith. Or another way to say it, there is trust, 
and things that, are, that we can see that, or we can read or there's proof of that. But then there's also the manifestation of that trust or of that faith. It's like our ordinary lives are surrounded by faith. Okay? You sat in the chair today because you had faith that it would hold you up. Okay? You have faith that it would hold you up. And, um, and so it's kind of sort of like that. In contrast to ordinary faith, the manifestation of faith is necessary to accomplish the special task that God, by revelation, asks us to do. So if God asks us to do something, the acting out or the, the, the choices and the decisions that we make based upon how God is revealing or speaking to us and how we hear from him, which is wisdom, knowledge, the first two manifestations, as God is speaking to us and we're hearing from him through knowledge and wisdom and, and we believe in that, the manifestation is faith. That is the manifestation of, of the Holy Spirit. When it comes to the miracles and gifts of healings, we need the manifestation of faith because we cannot heal the sick or do miracles by our human power. God must give us a, a message of knowledge and a, a message of wisdom, letting us know that it, is his, that it is his will for us to heal someone or do a miracle, and then we must have the faith to do it. God's calling you to do something. And all of these manifestations, there's nine of them. And I mentioned, even last week, it's almost like a Swiss Army knife. If I give you a Swiss Army knife, knife it's a gift. The gift is a Swiss Army knife. That Swiss Army knife has nine tools in it that you can use for whatever different purposes. That's a manifestation of the working of that gift, of that knife. Same with the Holy Spirit. God gives us the Holy Spirit. Many Christians are just letting the Holy Spirit, like a, like a Swiss Army knife, just sit on the shelf or in a junk drawer somewhere. They're not pulling out all of those gifts, uh, I mean, all of those manifestations of that. Because the gift is the Holy Spirit, and you can use those manifestations just like in a Swiss Army knife. And so, one of those is the acting out of what God wants us to do, which is faith. Every Christian needs to utilize the manifestation of faith. Christ said when, uh, Jesus Christ said that when people receive the Holy Spirit, they will receive power, but no one can operate the power of God without the faith to do it. Since every Christian needs to use a manifestation of faith to, to bring to pass the revelation that God gives them, every Christian has the ability to manifest that faith. And I like to try to give examples of this and the reason I'm going to use some of my own examples of my own life is because I was there, you know, and I experienced that. I was, I'm going to give you some examples today in today's message. And, and, and some of these you've heard before and some of them you haven't. But about 11 years ago, God was speaking to my heart about planting a church. And I had the revelation, the hearing from God about planting a church. Had no idea where it was going to go. Where, you know, I've never done that before. Obviously, I've been in ministry for a while. And so I received the revelation, and, and, and not only just in my time of prayer, but through other people and his word. And God was just speaking heavily on my heart. And that was the manifestation of the Holy Spirit as I was drawing closer uh, to him. And being used by that. And, but actually planting the church is the manifestation of that faith. It's a manifestation of the faith. Okay? It's like my marriage. I would hope that, that Suzanne heard from the Lord that she was supposed to marry me. And, um, and she took an act, a huge risk, I mean faith, by marrying me. And it was her act of faith that, you know what? I believe 
the Lord wants me to, to be with this guy for the rest of my life. And so she, she took that faith into action that was the manifestation of that faith. And so that faith that, that God wants you to manifest is something that is, that maybe it's something he's already spoken to you about and that maybe you haven't done that. But then again, I'm sure there's several of you here or watching online that God's called you to do something and you did do that. How scary it might be or, or whatever. But you know that if you manifest the faith of, of, of what God has told you to do, then you know that God's gonna be with you. So faith is the first one of the power of the manifestations. All right, the next two manifestations of the Holy Spirit we will actually cover together, okay? Uh, because they are similar in ways. The gifts, plural, of healing. Now, Paul uses the word gift, and, and some Christians believe, well, there it is. There, there's the word gift, and so Paul's really talking about gifts. These are gifts. These are not gifts. Because in, the, in verse 7, he actually says manifestations. Okay, the reason why gift is here, if you look at that, it's not one gift, it's gifts. In other words, what Paul is saying is there's all, different kinds of healings. And so because there's different kinds of healings, there are a variety of those. There's plural, gifts of healing. It is a gift. If you, if you want to be healed of something, it is a gift from the Lord. And so the gifts of healing is, um, is, is, is plural, and, um, and it's done out of the grace and the mercy of God. Uh, gifts and healings and, and workings of miracles are manifestations of the Holy Spirit because it takes a believer to do them by the power of God that he has been given. It is very important to realize that it is people empowered by the Holy Spirit within who do healings and miracles. It is very important, again, to realize it is a people empowered by the Holy Spirit who do healings and miracles. Now, on, on occasions, God heals or he does a, a miracle without the, the, the use of mankind, of, of humans. But that is not a manifestation of, the, of, the, uh, of healing or miracles because the gift of the Holy Spirit inside a Christian was not employed. So God has full authority to provide healing or do a miracle in our life. And, 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 and it could be something that, that doesn't involve us at all. But that's not really the manifestation of the Holy Spirit to get the Holy Spirit working in our life because it didn't really involve us. Now, obviously, it's a miracle and God's doing great stuff. But, but we have the ability as believers to manifest healings and miracles all around us. So the, what is the process of manifesting healing? To do a healing or miracle, several manifestations come into action. First, the person needs a message of knowledge and or a message of wisdom to know what the situation is and what to do about it. So take, for example, there's, there's healing in your life, or healing that needs need to take place in your life or someone you know. What's the first thing you do? Go lay your hands on them and pray over them? No, you, you hear from the Lord. You hear from the Lord. This is why you've got to open up all of the nine tools in your Swiss Army knife. And, and, and you've got to incorporate all the manifestations. You go for knowledge, for wisdom on what the Lord wants to do. And then if, you, if you've got the go-ahead, the green light, then you must move forward in, in the healing, in the manifestation of healing. The second thing, um, it needs the manifestation of faith to bring out the pa uh, to bring to pass the, the healing or miracle. So the actual healing or the actual miracle is a manifestation of that faith. Uh, in in, um, in Acts chapter nine verse forty, you can uh, you can turn to that with just one verse. Acts chapter nine verse forty. This is the apostle Peter who raised Tabitha to life, and it says this: Peter sent them all out of the room. Okay, so, so Peter's here in, in this room, and everybody, everyone's, you know, crying and, and a lot of distractions. Peter's like, okay, I'm sending everybody out of the room. 
Then he got down on his knees and prayed. It's the first thing he did. Got down on his knees and prayed. Dead girl lying on the bed. Turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes and seeing Peter, she sat up. So Peter spoke the miracle into being, but first Peter prayed. And then when he had the revelation from the Lord to go ahead, he raised her from the dead by the power of God. Once Peter received the revelation to raise Tabitha, he performed the miracle. I believe that there would be more miracles in healings today if Christians would step out in faith and do what the Lord tells them to do. Too often, we are waiting for God to do what he has given us the spiritual power to do. I've been in this situation before where I felt like I had a green light to go pray over someone to heal and and I didn't do it. I mean, it's, it's been a long time ago. And I didn't do it. I feel bad about it now. Maybe, maybe someone, maybe the Lord spoke to somebody else. And, you know, they, they had the, the awesome privilege of being a part of that. But, but imagine some of the miracles and healings that don't take place because as believers, all we do is we just, we, we pray, which is, it's not a bad thing. Obviously, we want to start there. We want to start there. When God or the Lord Jesus gives us a revelation to, to do a healing or miracle, that is not the time to pray. You pray to receive the knowledge and wisdom. Hey, you need to, you need to pray for this person. You need to go to that person. You need to go to the hospital. You need to go to, um, to wherever. I mean, there, there, there have been times that on, on no two occasions where there have been wombs that were just not opened and, and couples who weren't able to get pregnant. And I felt the Holy Spirit say, you need to, you need to call a, a prayer gathering and you need to pray for this couple. This happened on two occasions. You need to pray for this couple. So we did. And guess what? They got pregnant. And one couple has way too many kids than they need. But, you know, they're, they're doing great. But that's, but, so if all I did was hear from the Lord and I said, okay, Lord, just help them get, help them get pregnant. Just help them get pregnant. So God's like, no, put it into action. Go to them. Say, let me, let me pray for you. Let me pray for you. If you feel, if you feel, and sometimes it can happen in the moment. It can happen in the moment. God will say, all right, Holy Spirit will say, pray for them right now. Like, close your eyes, hold their hand, or put your hand on their head, or, or whatever. Whatever it takes, just pray for them about that situation. And whether it could, it could be a small miracle or a big miracle, but it's still a miracle. And too often times, we're just waiting. So, um, we see this. Good example in Exodus chapter 14. I'm going to the Old Testament. Exodus 14. This is Moses. We see this great example. 13 through 16. So Exodus chapter 14, verse 13 through 16. It says this. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today will, will uh, never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I love that. It's like God saying, okay, Moses, that's great. Stop praying. Stop praying and start doing. Get your staff. There needs to be a manifestation of faith, okay? A manifestation of faith is not just you you praying about something. It's you doing something. Okay, I hope I, I just I'm hoping I'm communicating with you. It's something you're, you're doing. 
that it's an action that's involved. That is a manifestation of the faith based upon the revelation and the wisdom that God has given you. Once God gave the revelation what to do, it was Moses' turn to act using the power of God has given him. We need to walk in that authority. It is clear that since every Christian has a gift of the Holy Spirit, that every Christian has a power to do healings and miracles just as the disciples of Christ and the prophets of old did. God has given that to you. Mir- the, 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 the ability to heal and to do miracles is not a gift. It's a manifestation. The gift is the Holy Spirit. I just want you to make sure you understand that. Move in authority. Walk in authority. I said, well, I'm not, a, I'm not a pastor. I'm not a Christian leader. I can't really do it. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Walk in that authority. It's going to seem a little weird sometimes, a little awkward if you're just getting started, but that's okay. Walk in that authority. So we have faith or trust really is a key word. And then the, the next two he, uh, healings and miracles and here's the fourth one. Remember, there's five. Here's the fourth one. Prophecy. The fourth manifestation is prophecy. The manifestation of prophecy is speaking, writing, or otherwise communicating a message from God to another person or persons. God or the Lord Jesus gives a Christian a message of knowledge or a message of wisdom via the Holy Spirit born inside him. And when he gives that message to someone else, it is prophecy. So don't think of prophecy as well, I'm, I'm not an Old Testament prophet. I don't have a, I don't have a big robe and a, and a beard and walk around and like John the Baptist eat locusts and honey. And that, I mean, I'm, I'm not a prophet. Good. I'm, I'm glad you don't, you don't do that. But we think of, we think of prophecy, you, you've got to have this certain, you know, look about you and, 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 and everything. The, the revelation is spoken as a prophecy can come in the moment, almost where every word by word, um, the speaker. And that's called inspirational prophecy. In other words, God will, God will give you a word for someone to edify them, okay? And sometimes it could also happen in the moment, called inspir- we call it inspirational prophecy, to where we are inspired in the moment to do that. Be open to that. In the Old Testament, when a person had the Holy Spirit, he or she almost always prophesied. If you read the Old Testament, that was a manifestation of the Spirit. When God's like, hmm, Holy Spirit, why don't you go on to that person? Now, let's see. Happened to King Saul, first king of Israel. Hey, Holy Spirit, why don't you zap that guy and let's see the manifestations. And what did the Bible say? He prophesied. He was prophesying. Uh, we see um, in Acts chapter 2, verse 17 through 18. If you, want, if you want to turn there. Acts chapter 2, verse 17 through 18. This is Peter uh, poor, um, as, as he was uh, quoting the prophet Joel. So this is, this is basically Old Testament Joel who had this, these words. And Peter's just u- using this and referring this on the day of Pentecost. It says this. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. That's the church. All people, your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams, even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit on those days and they will prophesy. That wasn't just for the apostles and the disciples and those people who are now dead and gone. The Holy Spirit is still here. (laughs) Remember, we're in Acts chapter 29. There's only 28 chapters. We're living Acts 29. It's a really, really, really long chapter. And we're living it out. Holy Spirit is still doing great things. And one of those manifestations is prophecy. So the, the, the purpose of the of prophecy is to strengthen, encourage, and comfort. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 1 through 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 1 through 5. It says this, follow the way of love, this is the Apostle Paul, and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit, especially what? Prophecy. Verse 2, for anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people but to God, 
Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the Spirit. But the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. Anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but the one who prophesies edifies the church. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues. In other words, I have that manifestation of tongues, but I would rather have you prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets that so the church may be edified. And we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. It can reveal the secrets of people's hearts so they can be closer to God. A, a study of prophecy in Scripture shows that prophecy is part of the power of God, which is why God places prophecy in the power group of manifestations. Now, prophecy isn't, I don't want you to be confused. Prophecy isn't always just like about the future. It's not always about the future. Like, you know, you need to tell this person, hey, in six months they're going to be fired from their job, and they're, but, but they're going to be hired. Now, that can happen, absolutely. God could give you that word, and that could be about the future. But it could also be something maybe that you're sensing that they're going through, and you have a prophetic word, and you should be able to say, you know what? I just want to let you know, Lord wants me to tell you something that he understands what you're going through, and he's, he hasn't left your side. He's with you. He understands. Okay? Now, I'm, I'm not saying that's just a sort of a blanket prophecy for anybody. It's got to be something that you hear from the Lord. I've, I've had conversations uh, of a wide variety of prophetic words. The guy's like, tell this to this person. As I'm talking in a conversation, the conversation will change because every time I have a conversation, especially a meeting with someone, I pray on the way to the meeting or as I'm walking in the meeting and said, Holy Spirit, I need you to be with me. I need you to speak to me because I'm talking to this person. You take over. And while we're talking and speaking, I will be attentive to what the Holy Spirit is doing. And oftentimes, I will get a, a nudge to go this certain direction. And it's all based upon the Spirit just moving, revelation, hearing from God. And then doing the manifestation of that with prophecy of edifying and helping them. This past year in 2021, uh, I've shared this before, I had, a, had a, a good friend of mine, a man, a man who walks, man, walks with Jesus like, like none other. And he calls me at 4.30 in the morning and says, Frank, I've got, I've got something for you, you know. And he, he, he began to tell me these things that's going to that's gonna happen. And he, and he tells me, but, but Frank, your family is going to be fine. And sure enough, about eight, seven, eight months later, exactly what he said <laughs> happened. In fact, I forgot about that prophecy until about a month into this ordeal in 2021. And, and I remembered, I was like, oh my gosh, that's exactly what he, what he told me. And then I remembered, guess what? But you're gonna be fine. And it gave us power. And it, it gave us the ability to sus be sustained. And it gave us encouragement. And so God can't give you those sort of prophetic words. So we have faith, we have healings and miracles, we have prophecy, and here's the last one. Discerning of Spirits. A final manifestation, discerning of spirits. A manifestation of discerning of spirits is necessary if men and women of God are going to deal effectively with the spiritual realities of this fallen world. Ephesians 6.12. I know you've heard this uh, several times. I've preached on this. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Our adversary, the devil, walks about as a roaring lion seeking people to devour. God has not left us helpless in that situation, but he has empowered us to deal with it. The manifestation of discerning of spirits is more than just recognizing them. It also involves entering into battle against them and casting them out. So if you look at the Greek word, like going back to the Greek, if you go back, look at the Greek word for the word discerning, it's uh, diocrisis. That's a Greek word, how you pronounce it, diocrisis. And that definition means it's a distinguishing or a differentiation, 
a distinguishing or a differentiation. But it also means this, to quarrel, to fight. So, diocracies can mean much more than just discerning or differentiation. It has the overturns, overtones of quarreling or fighting. Since discerning of spirits is a total package of recognizing spirits and dealing with them, God places it in the power of manifestations. The manifestations of, of discerning of spirits is interwoven with other manifestations. For example, a believer manifesting, uh, manifesting discerning of spirits may be simultaneously aware of the presence of maybe a demonic force, know what to do about it in the situation, and begin to command for it to come out. So, the discerning of spirits is not all about understanding that there is a, a demonic activity around your certain situation. It's also going into war, going into battle with that sort of force. But I also want you to know that the discerning of spirits is not always about identifying someone who may be demon-possessed. Now, I, I grew up in a church that, I grew up in a church that um, there were some people that had the manifestation to, and the faith, to cast out someone who was demon-possessed, to cast out a demon. And I actually saw it. I was like 13 years old. Freaked me out. <laughs> but I saw, and, and, and just know this, casting out demons, we may not see it right here in Bartow County, although I guarantee you there's people who are demon-possessed. Some of you think, well, my, my children are demon-possessed. <laughs> Sometimes we think that. No, but in all seriousness, all around the world, there's demonic activity all around the world. You talk to missionaries, they cast out lots of demons and people. But so, I don't want you to think that, that this is so rare that you know, oh, I, don't really have, I don't really run across people who, who have demonic activity. But discerning of spirits also means the discerning of spirits, meaning all kinds of spirits. So a believer can't be possessed by a demon. Why? Because the Holy Spirit's here. No room. Can't do it. Cannot be possessed by, by a, a demon. By a devil. But a Christian can hold on to or let a spirit linger. I've seen the manifestations of the spirit of gossip, of the spirit of dissension, this, the, the, the critical spirit. I've seen that in believers. And why do I see that? Because believers are like, they like that. They like that gossip. It's feeding their flesh. They like that critical spirit. It's helping. And so even though they may not be demon-possessed, they can latch on to that and, and, and allow a, a demonic force to be around them and linger. And guess what? Your discerning spirit can pick up on that and say, hmm, I'm calling that for what that is. And you need to step out in boldness and say that. I'm calling out for what that is. That's a demonic force, a critical spirit, a, a spirit of gossip, a spirit of, of dissension. There's all kinds of different spirits. Spirit of sexual immorality, spirit of pornography. There's spirit, there is a spirit of pornography. And yes, believers can latch onto that and allow that to linger. And you got to call that out for what it is. You got to do battle with that. So, as we close, because I need to close. So, just, again, gifts versus manifestations. 
I want to reiterate the difference between gifts and manifestations. Most Christians commonly use the word gifts to describe what the Bible calls manifestations of the Spirit. Manifestation does not mean gift. A manifestation is an evidence, a showing forth of something that a person already has. You already have all nine of those if you are born a born-again believer. The major problem that occurs when the manifestation of the Holy Spirit are thought to be gifts is that it causes many Christians to be spiritually passive. Y'all, this is huge as I close this out. I need you to track with me on this. When you think of these manifestations as gifts, when you think of these manifestations as gifts, you think, oh, well, I don't really have that gift. So I'm just going to move back. Let somebody else do that. You know how many other Christians are also doing the same thing? A lot. So guess what? The, the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, we're just back. Oh, somebody else must have that gift. Somebody else must have that gift of, of healing. Somebody else must have the, that gift. That, that gift to cast out demons. Somebody else must have that gift of faith. and Somebody else must have that gift of tongues, interpretation of tongues. I'll give that to somebody else. No, no, no. When we think of them as gifts, we think we don't have them. We have to think manifestations. The gift is the Holy Spirit. You have that if you're born again. Congratulations. And you have at your disposal all the manifestations of those nine parts of, of the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit can do in your life. You just got to exercise those manifestations. You've got to, and, and, and even the, the manifestation of faith, of faith, that's why I said that, that manifestation of faith is sort of the, the foundation of this. Doing some of those things, you've got you've to gotta trust. You've got to trust, okay, I believe I, I believe I have the manifestation of healing, and I believe that God is telling me to go and pray for this person, and I'm going to walk out on faith or trust, and I'm going to do that. Can I tell you something? You're going to exercise your, gift, your manifestations in a way that's going to bring amazing abilities and revelation of what God can do in your life. So I want to encourage you as we close out this series, the Holy Ghost series. The Holy Ghost is not just for the New Testament acts and that's it. Holy Ghost is alive and active. We're just keeping that, that spiritual Swiss army knife in the junk drawer somewhere. Find it, use it, and open those up and figure it out. What's this thing for? How do you use this? Where can I use this? It's like a Swiss army knife. You have those at your disposal. So I want to make sure, encourage you to use those by faith, by trust. But guess what? You got to be connected to God. You got to be connected to the Lord. You got to walk in the Spirit. As I began this series, you can't do something that's going to, it's going to clog up or quench that Spirit in your life. You've got unforgiveness or if you've got deliberate sin you're doing or, or, or you've got strife within someone, Holy Spirit's going to back up and say, I'll, I'll just wait for you to kind of get, you know, Get dealing with that. The Holy Spirit has got to come alive in you. So spend time with the Lord. Ask the Lord to fill you, to, to fill you up, to, uh, to baptize you, to immerse you in the power of the Holy Ghost because he will just pray. But before you do that, you got to, you got to invite him into your life. So every head bowed, every eye closed as, as we get out of here. I just, I want to make sure that if you are watching or listening or lying, and maybe you're here today, you're like, Frank, I, I'm, I'm just having issue after issue. I'm just living a life that's, um, 
that's not victorious, and I need some power, I need some help. Well, just first of all, make sure that you have accepted Christ. And if you haven't, it's really easy. You could just say, Jesus, I believe in you. Jesus, I want you to be part of my life. Please forgive me my sin. I open the door of my heart. Come into my life. Help me to live for you. And if you have accepted that, that as Jesus' Lord and Savior, to start this journey of asking the Lord to immerse you in the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hey, I want to encourage y'all next week to uh, come back, Vision Sunday. I'm super excited about showing you what God's been doing. And bring a friend. And there's a lot of excitement building about it. And uh, we love you guys, and we we'll hope to see y'all next week. Thank y'all so very much.